Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to Chamber Chats. We're doing this, as always, uh, at the premises of one of our chamber champions, and we're going to meet another one in a minute. Uh, our friends at Czech Media Group is where we are. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territory of the Lekwungen speaking nations known to us as the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union. So if you yourself didn't attend Camosun College, you know somebody, you know a lot of people who did, somebody who might have taken blood work or fixed your car or cooked your meal in a restaurant, maybe even taught your kids. Camosun is a huge part of this community and they're a huge part of the chamber. In fact, they're our most recent chamber champion. We want to check in to see what's going on with Camosun College President Lane Trotter. Dr. Trotter, how are you? Very well, Bruce, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, let's show off the sweatshirt. First of all, show us that. Yeah. So this is our 50th anniversary uh, sweatshirt. And normally I'm in a suit and tie. I have the tie on underneath, but I just decided I'm wearing our hoodie. I am so proud of this college. Yeah, well, we're we're all proud to have it here too. So uh, you weren't here in 2019, pre-pandemic, but let's talk in terms of what do you feel Camosun is doing now? Where is the college at now compared to where it was in 2019? Uh, I, just before I answer that, I just want to say, as you did the land acknowledgement, I just want to note that uh, Camosun College is on the territories of the Lagwangan and Husainich peoples for our two campuses, and we thank them for welcoming our students. In terms of your questions, where we are from 2019 to now, well, we're still in a bit of a recovery phase, but what I can say is that our programs are running. We're offering more online and hybrid learning. Uh, students are still getting the education that they, they want and need uh, and delivered in different formats. But some of the challenges that we face are finding living accommodations. So that's a cost of living issue, uh, as well as dealing with uh, some, some shortages uh, in the labor market. Yeah, that's pretty common across pretty much all sectors right now. So some of the things that you did as a pivot during the pandemic, for example, the hybrid learning and that sort of thing, that's, that's going to stay, do you think? Yeah, when, when we went into lockdown, we turned on a dime every institution in the province did. And within a span of a day or a couple of days, everybody was delivering programming online in March, 2020. So we're continuing to deliver programming online, but we also do hybrid learning and we also are back in the classroom. And so this is based on what are the needs for the student. And again, our focus is on uh, relevant uh, and uh, innovative applied learning that is linked to the needs of the community. Like a lot of what you do can't be done virtually. Right. If you're going to be in the trades building at the interurban campus, that's you got to be there for that in person. Absolutely. And, and with our trades program, so we offer a whole bunch of Red Seal programs. We have to make sure that we meet national standards uh, for the programs. And as we're doing that, the students need to work on the, the equipment. Now, for the apprentices, they're already in industry. They come to us. But for persons, uh, our students who are doing what we call uh, pre-employment programs, they come to us for a period of time. And then that they get credit for their first year of apprenticeship. And so can be hard to do virtually. For example, if you're going to do welding virtually, then you're not really doing welding. Although you can do a lot of the pre-learning before you get your hands on the material. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with so many of them. Culinary is the same thing. That's all in the kitchen at the Institute at, uh, at uh, Interurban Campus. So uh, yes, another, another part that was always a huge part of life at Camosun was the international students. And of course that... Yeah completely shut down in March of 2020. Tell me about the recovery of that cohort and how they're coming along. Well, uh, in uh, March 2020, we were at about 1,800 international students. We're back to 1,700 international students today. Uh, so we're not quite where we were at three years ago, but we're starting to recover uh, quite nicely. And we have students coming from over 70 countries. Isn't that amazing? You know, when we take a look too at the... Uh, at the variety and the breadth of things that are offered. Mm -hmm. It's like 160 programs or something that, that you offer through Camosun. Is that an accurate number? That's about, uh, that's about right. And programs from one-year certificates to two-year diplomas and associate degrees uh, to uh, programs, advanced diplomas, post-degree certificates, advanced certificates, of course, are uh, applied uh, degrees, 
uh, and and what we run with micro credentials and just courses um, through our uh, professional studies and industry training and services unit. Yeah, in previous chamber chats, we have talked about the uh, sort of the audit of curriculum, if you will, or what what elements of curriculum are going to grow, which ones will shrink, which ones will stay, which ones will go. So how has that all evolved throughout the pandemic and what have you learned from it? Well, the pandemic made us take a look at how we delivered our curriculum from being uh, what you would call um, sage on the stage or um, to being delivered in various formats, again, online and hybrid. Hybrid can work great if you are a parent and have a sick child, then you can uh, log into your class and take the class that day. Uh, and so we're trying to deliver maximum flexibility for students in terms of the pet, what's called the pedagogy of, of delivery. But in terms of the programs themselves, we're bringing online new programs. Uh, a brand new program we've brought online is cybersecurity uh, technology. And again, that responds to the need in the community and the country for people to secure our IT systems. We're also looking at developing other programs that will respond to the industry needs uh, in Southern Vancouver Island, uh, as well as the province. And then what, something else that we announced in January that we had launched two years ago, um, but we've added a new component is our sonography program, ultrasound. So students are working, so we're offering a ultrasound clinic at Interurban. People come in like it's part of Island Health, which it is. And we have four students assisting the sonography technicians, the ultrasound technicians. Uh, and isn't that an amazing learning experience that the students get? So they're learning, the professionalism, they're learning, their competency. So that by the time they graduate and are working, they're fully up to speed and meet industry needs and standard. Yeah, I want to unpack a bunch of that stuff in a second. But first of all, I was actually poking around the website, just sort of yeah. looking at that variety of curriculum. Yeah. What's the archaeological? Uh, it's like an assistant or a, something for an archaeological project. What's that one? I can't speak to that one because we have, as you mentioned, over 160 programs. Uh, but what I can say is that on the program breadth that we have, uh, we offer a range of programs from university arts and sciences to our one and two uh, year programs, to our advanced diplomas, to our degrees that respond to industry needs. And so at the beginning of the show, you mentioned people who've gone to Camosun, and I hear about it all the time. Somebody's child, they themselves went, an aunt or uncle went. And so we respond to all the needs in the community. And we also make sure that our students, if they wanna get a degree and continue their studies, they can. And we work so well with University of Victoria and of course, Royal Roads University. Yeah, I just mentioned the archaeology thing because it could pique people's interest. So camosin.ca is the website. If you want to find out more about that really cool course, you can go online and, uh, and check and it out. I don't think I'll do the same. Okay, great. We'll catch up and have a coffee and chat about that. <laughs> so um, next, I want to move along and talk about what we're doing to sort of keep up with the demand for workforce in the economy. And we'll talk about that next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Dr. Lane Trotter. He's the president of Camosin College. Uh, you've already mentioned the fact that you're curriculum is framing up around technology and the fact that, you know, we're doing this on Zoom. Technology is a huge part of our life. You're teaching through a hybrid model. Tell me about the growth in, in the technology uh, curriculum at Camosun. Well, uh, COVID certainly drove that change to online and hybrid learning. And we also found that it was a great tool now that we've come back to also delivering on, uh, in person again, of meeting the needs of, of learners. We hear from all of our learners, some who want to be in the classroom, and that's really critical for trades, some because they have parental duties who uh, need an option where they can't get uh, childcare to be able to take that class uh, from home, and then the online classes that, that we deliver. So we offer these ranges of modality, learning modalities that respond to student needs based on what the students are trying to learn. And the great thing about it is it's a way of increasing access to education. You're a trade school as well. And the, 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 coalition, the correlation rather now between trades and technology is, is the same. I mean, the, the trades are no longer a matter of just whether it's physical labor or whatever. like technology is embedded in all of that now, right? Technology is in everything we do. Uh, so uh, for example, our chat today, technology is at the base of it. Yep. And technology that we don't necessarily have to understand the inner workings, but we know how to just click a link, open up the window and away we go. So we don't have to be, we don't need a master's in understanding how the technology was developed. We just need to use an app. 
So we build that into our programming and the faculty and staff that we have here are amazing. And that's what allows us to continue to be relevant in how we deliver our programs. Um, I, again, that ties back to the concept that everybody needs now, which is lifelong learning. You had mentioned also that the uh, one of the new things is in the healthcare area, the healthcare sector. Again, in the pandemic, we realized that we need more healthcare workers. We need to have a better understanding of our healthcare system. We need to have a better ability to to provide service to an aging population. So tell me about the healthcare stuff. What else? You mentioned that new course, but what else is going on in the healthcare faculty? Well, uh, of course, we continue to partner with the University of Victoria on our nursing program. We do uh, five semesters. They do three semesters when the students finish with uh, their joint BSEN, so Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Uh, we also offer a program in personal care worker. Um, so th there's a variety of programs that we're, we're offering designed support um, students' needs, the needs of, of employers. But one program that I'm really proud of is our, our dental hygiene and our dental assisting programs. In fact, we have a community clinic here at the Lansdowne campus where you can go for uh, a dental cleaning with our students. Now, it might take a little bit longer than if you're going to see your dentist because our students are learning, but they're overseen by certified dental hygienists. And, and, that, and, you know, and we also work with some dentists who come in and provide some pro bono work in certain cases. So that's just a way that, again, having the students learn with real people to a standard, and making sure that we can provide some affordable health care to the broader community who may not be able to access dental care otherwise. And that's, again, something that couldn't have been done virtually. So that had to be a sort of an in-classroom experience. And to just go a little further along with that, the trades program, there's not a single construction company or project on right now that's not looking for help. It's not looking for workers. So the trades program, again, in, in conjunction with the technology that's involved, but you're turning out tradespeople all the time, all the time. And we're getting calls all the time from employers saying, we need more tradespeople, we need more tradespeople. And we're responding as quickly as we can. One of the challenges that we face, just like employers face in the community, is sometimes being able to hire qualified uh, faculty uh, instructors to teach the materials. And so that's this, this uh, bootstrapping exercise that we're all in right now, which is we're all trying to get uh, a limited uh, pool of candidates um, to do the, the same type of work. So I think you're maybe in a position uh, that when you are trying to attract those instructors in trades and things like that, you're competing with the open market. Like if somebody who is a qualified drafts person or an electrical contract, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. the private sector might pay them more than what you can pay them at the college. So what, where's the solution in that? Well, I think, I think the balancing act is is where, where are you in your career and what is it that you want? So um, most employers pay significantly more than we do. Uh, and, and so that makes it difficult to attract people. But some of the benefits that we have are around our pension, uh, around our, our benefits packages. Um, and the other is of course around um, vacation and the flexibility with, with, with vacation. So those are some of the things that we can do, call it the entire compensation package that we can provide. Uh, so it's not just purely about money, it's looking at the quality of life issue. And the hours are better. They're not, they're not the on call. <laughs> That's the hours great. are better. Uh, academia has always been the leading uh, thought exercise in addressing climate change. So the same thing is happening at Camosun. I want to talk about that next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Dr. Lane Trotter, president at the amazing Camosun College. So climate change, we're seeing it every day. We're seeing it around the world. We're seeing it in our own backyard. Um, Camosun is very much involved in addressing solutions and mitigation of climate change. So let's talk about that for a sec. Well, first, I, I, I want to acknowledge is that uh, uh, Camosun College has been active in trying to address climate change. Our board declared a climate emergency a number of years ago, so we're very much aware of what we're doing. We've been renovating and upgrading our buildings, making sure that when, we, uh, when, when we're doing that work, that they're brought up to a certain standard to reduce emissions uh, by dealing with insulation, by dealing with lighting standard, by making sure that the building has all the current code issues that older buildings don't always meet. So that's one of the things that we also, uh, I just want to uh, take a moment and thank the ministry for their support for government for helping us with that. 
Another element that we do is this is baked into quite literally our new strategic plan. So as we're looking at making sure that we uh, uh, address the issue of the challenges of climate change, that's one of the paddles of our new strategic plan, which we have six paddles. Uh, and these are tied to how do we support our community? Three tied to the college, three tied to supporting our community. And of course, we have our own climate action group we call C4. Uh, the Camosun College Climate Change Committee that is uh, working to make sure that we address uh, and how we can address issues related to climate change. Uh, and that group is very active in helping the college look at some of the actions we can take from the small to the big. And thank you for doing all of that. Also a big shout out uh, to the Indigenous element of education at Camosun. We at the Chamber are undertaking some economic reconciliation with Indigenous business owners. But what you're doing on the Indigenous curriculum side is very exciting. Explain that. So uh, one of the paddles uh, that I just mentioned is doing good work together. And that's a, a Sanchothan word, uh, which is pronounced I che Nuel O. And so, again, that reflects how we're trying to deal with our journey of reconciliation um, as part of both TRC, a Truth and Reconciliation, but, Paul, but also part of uh, uh, DRIPA. And so we're working with our First Nations communities, uh, and we were given permission to use that word uh, by, one of the, uh, by one of our elders, uh, Dr. John Elliott. Um, uh, Jacintin. Uh, and so that becomes very important to how do we work together. Again, it ties back to the climate change issue. It ties to how we make sure that our programs meet the needs of community. So this is something that will be embedded in, uh, in how the college moves forward um, over the next five years. And you know what's really cool is the film studio project. Let's, yes. yeah, go. Let's talk about that. Where's it at and where's it going? So uh, with our new film studio, we went through a process looking uh, for, um, uh, for what you could call uh, an RFP. Uh, through that process, we've identified uh, an organization. And right now we've just started negotiations with that entity to uh, discuss how can they meet the needs that are outlined. Um, of course, as we're doing that work, we'll be working with our board because before we can just announce it, it needs final board approval and then we need ministry approval, government approval to make sure that the needs are there. And of course, we need uh, approval from uh, the city of Saanich uh, because that film studio would be located uh, uh, at the south end of our interurban uh, campus, uh, right, uh, right near Paisi. And I'm really excited by this because think of the programming opportunities. We've envisioned three film studios, uh, sound stages. Each sound stage can hire uh, up to 300 people. 300 good paying jobs times three, so 900 times the supports around it. That'll be a real boon for our community. Uh, and again, those sound stages, when people worry about, well, it's going to be noisy. Not on a soundstage, you need it quiet when you're, when you're filming. So that's one of the things that we'll work on with our local community to make sure that their concerns are addressed. And the other cool part about that is that it's more than that production facility. Uh, it can tie into curriculum. You can teach yeah. set building and electrical and lighting and shooting and camera and editing and all that stuff. That's really, it's well, amazing. It, it, it's, a full, it's a full ecology of programming. And whether that's on the production front, whether that's on the graphics and media front, whether that's on, on the trade side, um, it's a full ecology of programming that we have opportunities to develop. And in fact, that's built into the proposal uh, for this, which is both a film studio and education. There needs to be a win-win and we wanna benefit the community, we wanna benefit the college, and we wanna benefit whoever the successful um, uh, organization is that we're negotiating with. Yeah. Um, okay, I wanna get into something that Chamber has been working on for quite some time. You referenced earlier on about housing and how much of an issue that is. It's for you, it's for your students, it's for the general workforce. Yeah. One of the things that we like to remind people of all the time is that post-secondaries are not allowed to incur debt. And for that reason, it, 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 you can't find the money to build housing. Like Camosun has no on-campus housing. UVic wants more. Royal Roads has looked at it. We're advocating to the federal or provincial government, uh, in the case of the federal government, to say that maybe if you did incur debt, they could guarantee it. 
or the province would change the regulations to say that you can incur debt or that they will guarantee it on your behalf. Because when you think about, I'm going to go on for a second here, but when you think about all of the students that are living in open market housing, if more of them lived on campus, that would free up that housing for workforce. So tell me if there's any progress in that these days. Well, uh, I'm happy to report that we submitted our um, housing proposal, our student residence proposal to government. Government has it right now. They're reviewing it. Uh, we're working on some of the details with them. And while I don't have uh, anything that I can announce, what I can say is just a couple of weeks ago, uh, government announced in the new budget that they would be looking at funding 4,000 new student beds um, for the 25 public post-secondary institutions in the province. Uh, and so that's good news for us because that means our proposal, which is in, meets that criteria. We're working on a facility that would house potentially 425 beds, be nine stories tall, and be located initially at our Lansdowne campus. And when I say initially, our, we also have a proposal to eventually build, and not in the far distant future, but in the near term, a second student residence out at our interurban campus as well. Well, that's good news, and that's what we want to hear. That's that's fantastic. Uh, just going to wrap it up here. Uh, the chamber is celebrating. You're celebrating 50 years. Our chamber is celebrating 160 years this year. We are Western Canada's first and oldest chamber of commerce. So, as a part of that celebration of 160, we found the capacity to create a $160,000 endowment to create student awards, right. so that students can then move forward and study. But just, just very, and I speak this fluently because I've chaired a university foundation board, but the importance of endowing money to allow peace students to study, how important is that? Having money in place for students, especially now, is critically important so that students uh, can make sure that they can get an education. The, the issue is tuition isn't that expensive, relatively speaking. It's the cost associated with housing and food and everything else. And as we know, the price of food keeps going up. Um, so anything that we can do to support students um, with bursaries and endowments is fantastic. And that $160,000 uh, that the Chamber's putting together as a means of doing that is appreciated. So thank you so much to those in the Chambers who have funded that. Um, it means a great deal to us. Uh, and for those of us who've had student support uh, in our past um, and have been there, thank you. You make a difference in the lives of our students. Sure do. And Camosun makes a difference in the life of our community, too. Dr. Lane Trotter, happy 50th again to Camosun College. Thank you for your time. We're going to hook up again in a couple of weeks with uh, Dr. Kevin Hall from UVic to talk about co-op programs because they're important, too. But in the meantime, thank you for your time, as always. Thank you very much, Bruce, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. Lane Trotter. I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chat.